Hello and welcome to the Journey Journals. My name is Gaia from Life of Gaia and today we will be exploring the fascinating topic of shadow work and plant medicines and really taking a journey and, and, an, and an exploration into the darkness within. Now why I think this is such an important topic of conversation is that we tend to live in a society that is very much around you know, the pursuit of happiness and being joyful the whole time and being happy and staying positive. But really, you know, we are human beings and we've been given all sorts of emotions that include senses of failure, sadness, grief, uh, and many others. And I find shadow work is so important because it helps integrate all these different feelings, which are really part and parcel of us. So today, it is my honor and pleasure to have Charmaine Hewson here with us today. Charmaine has been with us before and she's a wealth of knowledge. She is also an art therapist, a counselor, and she helps people integrate plant medicine journeys. And so it's my absolute pleasure to have her here today to talk to us about plant medicines and shadow work and art therapy in general. Welcome, Charmaine. Thank you, Gaia. It is a pleasure to be here again with you. I look forward to diving deep into this topic that is so important. Thank you, Charmaine. So let's get started. Could you explain to us just in broad terms what shadow work is and how it relates to personal growth and self-discovery? Shadow work, the idea of doing shadow work is looking at aspects of self that maybe we have put into the shadows within or parts of self that we may feel shame over or discomfort in sharing. And so when we have these feelings inside and we keep stuffing them down and down darker further, um, we end up with shadow work, we shine light on them to bring acceptance to them, to recognize that they are part of us. What happens if we don't do that is our shadows leak out into our personality, into our life, our relationships, our way of being in the world. So when we can really understand our shadow and accept it in a way that is not creating a judgment, we end up also accepting ourselves in a way that is more complete. And because we're shining light on the shadow, just as when you do shine light on a shadow, it goes away or it moves, transforms and becomes something different. Now, I wanted to ask you, I've done a fair amount of shadow work myself, and honestly, it's not for the faint hearted. Um, it took a lot of courage. It took a lot of bravery. Um, and it feels very, very uncomfortable while it's happening, you know, but I'm very grateful to have done it. It, it was life altering. I wanted to ask you what um, sort of qualities or mindsets do you think are necessary for an individual to have before they start embarking on this type of work? Yeah, that's a really important question, because oftentimes when we're feeling discomfort in our mental health, in our life. And um, there can be this urgency to just fix it now, go as deep, as dark as you can to just rip that Band-Aid off. Uh, that's not always the best time to embark on shadow work. It's a journey. And so I, I know when I work with clients, I will definitely not in the first session, are we going to start in on shadow work, right? We're going to create a vortex of healing, right? We're going to talk about what healing looks like, what safety looks like, what stabilization looks like. And even if someone isn't there, at least we know and have an idea of what that is so that people are able to have a foot in both uh, camps, in both areas, right? In that healing vortex, in safety, as we tiptoe in slowly to the shadow work. So, and definitely a readiness for change. Someone has to be ready and willing. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of courage to do this work. So knowing that you are safe and you are being supported by um, uh, preferably a professional uh, um, therapist that can, can support that work. Uh, it's deep work. 
It is indeed. And it's it's deep work that I feel now with the uh, popularity of plant medicines and entheogens coming to the forefront, that people are turning to these as you know important tools to facilitate the process of shadow work. What are some of you know some examples of how plant medicines can facilitate shadow work and the process in general? A lot of people are using psychedelics and entheogens, altered states of consciousness to kind of dive right in to open things up. Um, and so often uh, what's important uh, when we're working with these medicines, we're working with altered states of consciousness, pieces can come up that are very uncomfortable, uh, that could be considered a shadow. Uh, they can be very scary and there can be uh, an unwillingness to dive into that or to look at that. My experience has been that when these pieces show up while using medicines, while using plant medicines or psychedelics and theogens, altered states of consciousness, meditation, however one gets to that experience, what I find most important is to face that aspect of self, right? Because these are all aspects of self. Um, uh, or because we're working in different realms, it could be that it's not an aspect of self. And so the way to distinguish that in my experience is to ask, are you my teacher? Uh, if that is so, uh, it will remain. And then there's the process of allowing an acceptance and knowing that you're safe to look at this part of you. If it's not your teacher, this feeling, this experience, uh, apparition or uh, hallucination that may be happening in plant medicine ceremonies or psychedelic ceremonies will uh, disappear it is uh, has been my experience in the past and uh, one that I've noticed with others as well so it's a really great tool to know right we are opening things up when we're using these plant medicines these altered states of consciousness that can feel extremely dysregulating um, so that would be my advice around that Mm, thank you. And yes, you know, plant medicines are definitely a tool, but they are also at the same time not for everyone. And I feel another really, really important tool that comes up with um, with the uh, facilitation of shadow work and bringing that to the forefront is art therapy, which you specialize in. Could you tell us a little bit about art therapy in relationship to shadow work? I work as an art therapist, uh, I use art often, right? Obviously, that's that's what we use is art to get to the roots of uh, the unconscious to see what the unconscious wants to share. So, with art, using art in therapy and uh, collaboratively with uh, shadow work, um, there's bunch of pieces that come up there if I'm working specifically with someone usually the shadow just comes up anyways right because we're working with the unconscious and so what happens is whatever's meant to be dealt with or worked through rises to the surface um, when we're working spontaneously however I do find uh, some materials that work uh, quite effectively when we're working with shadow are uh, black papers um, using a black background. And I always leave this up to the client to choose, uh, but there's always an option in my studio to use black paper. I do notice that people that are working through deep depression or sadness, um, and especially shadow work, are automatically drawn to this. It's like their unconscious knows that this will be supportive. And as you see some of my artwork in the background, uh, I use black paper. What I find when I'm using black paper is, uh, well, first when I'm using white paper, right? When we're using regular light color paper, when we're creating shadow, we're filling the shadow in with the white paper. When we're using darker papers, we are only filling in the highlight. And so what's happening in our brain when we're using art therapy, we're integrating the right and left hemisphere of the brain. We're changing neural pathways within the brain. And so by using this as a metaphor, we're changing the way we look at the world too, where we are looking for the highlights instead of looking for the darkness. And so that's one way that can be super effective. 
Another uh, material I often use with people and my own personal experience has been too, is working with clay. So and um, this is not something that I would ever recommend as doing as a first step, step process working with clay uh, because it can be very activating uh, for other reasons. Um, but when we're focusing on the shadow, just using the movement, uh, that cathartic feel release as we're moving the clay, adding water, uh, adding more water, uh, using that earth, smelling that earth, feeling that groundedness can be very supportive. And also it's not always that we're creating something, but that that, that image is always living within and we're just moving the clay out of the way to reveal what's already waiting for us to look at. Shaman, could you speak a little bit into why clay as a material is activating? One of the precautions in art therapy, um, and this is why art therapy requires, you know, a master's level diploma or degree. Uh, there's a lot of precautions. Um, so when we're working with clay in art therapy, we are. It, what can happen is um, it can be very triggering, especially if someone has experienced sexual assault. So the sound of the clay can sometimes mimic sexual assault. Um, the, uh, the feeling to uh, the uh, texture, the wetness of it. Um, so we have to be very careful. It's not that I would never use clay with people who are survivors of sexual assault. It can actually be quite healing when they have moved into their own power, when they've moved into uh, that place where he the healing matrix has been established, right? Our safety and stabilization following that three-stage trauma therapy guideline. Um, the first one is safety and stabilization. So when that has been achieved, we can move into working clay. Absolutely. But I would never, ever use it with uh, people as a, um, uh, a first experience with with art and with shadow work interesting i i had no idea and um so speaking of precautions you know if we circle back to the other to to the other tool that we mentioned earlier being plant medicines what are some of you know the precautions to keep in mind around that modality of addressing shadow work you know, I know sometimes people are on antidepressants or, you know, what, what, what in your mind are some of the precautions and considerations to, to look at when using plant medicines for shadow work? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, a bit of a conundrum for many people. They hear about plant medicines and psychedelics being this one-stop shop for healing. Uh, uh, that's not what I believe at all. Um, I feel like Plant medicines open up a window and the work is done afterwards in the integration. Um, but what happens is for a lot of people wanting that, you know, that that pill to fix everything, um, they may already be on SSRIs or, uh, you know, antipsychotics or um, just supportive medications uh, to help them. So there is huge contraindications with using any of these medicines with plant medicines or psychedelics. And there's just not enough research done yet too, right? So it's very important that people who have been using antidepressants or medications to support depression, even 5-HTP I've noticed, right? Which is a supplement, uh, has contraindications with psychedelics. So um, uh, St. John's word even, right? These are natural. We think they kind of may go with plant medicines. They don't. And so it's really important to be aware of uh, what you're already um, taking and that there be at least a three-month period. Um, in my experience and from what I've heard from uh, doctors, I'm not a, a doctor, but this is what, um, what the research is showing, that there be a time of... Um, where one is not using antidepressants before using the plant medicines. Um, Charmaine, do you have any personal experiences or anecdotes that you could share with us about, 
you know, sort of the transformative power of shadow work combined with plant medicines that you've experienced yourself, or even with any other altered state of consciousness? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, right? We're we're talking about plant medicines, but really, I feel like it's a bigger topic, and that's altered states of consciousness. And then coming back to the contraindications with medication, um, uh, one still may want that deep healing that can happen from altered states of consciousness. This can be achieved with meditation. It can be achieved with breath work. And so then you're not dealing with the contraindications of medicines. Um, but yes, my uh, experience with shadow work and especially with the plant medicines, I know at the beginning I um, of using um, ayahuasca in particular, it was very scary for me because I'm already sensitive to energies or spirits around. And so what I felt was I would move beyond the veil and see everything all at once, see all spirits, beings. Um, and it was so scary for me. And I pay attention to them because I was seeing them and I didn't have any tools to do different. So it took me a lot of work to first learn that I could check in and say, are you my teacher? And they would just disappear. It took a lot of work too to recognize that it was important to not focus on these energies. Um, and to really tap into my own inner power, to know that I could trust myself um, and, uh, and trust that process that would be happening for me. Interesting. And, you know, we, we've spoken about this before that, you know, going into a plant medicine ceremony is certainly helpful, but really that the majority of the work happens afterwards in the integration portion of it and, and really everyday life after that. Um, could you tell us how individuals can integrate the insights that they get in a plant medicine ceremony or du even during a meditation or in art therapy um, into their everyday lives, um, you know, sort of in this ongoing practice around working with their shadows? What I find with, um, in ways to integrate, and especially ways to integrate shadow, right? Because these medicines, that's what they often do. They bring up our shadow. They bring up these scary places inside to move things, to shake things up so that we're able to transform. Uh, but that doesn't always happen within the ceremony. It's afterwards that this lasting healing happens. And it's uh, my experience, my belief that that healing happens from within, right? So often what we do in life is we're looking outside of ourselves for support. Um, and absolutely, these uh, experiences, these uh, medicines can open up the window but the real work is done after in the integration process. And so ways that I often recommend to support that integration is to connect to the spirit of the medicine, right? We're talking about plant medicines and anyone who has used these medicines has also uh, noticed uh, that there's a spirit to it. There's an energy to these medicines. Um, and even when we're working with, say, um, like breath work, so we're not even using a medicine, there's still an energetic component to that experience. And so we can always tap into that experience, right? Tap into the strength of that experience to be like a companion, right? To give us extra support when we're needing it. Uh, another piece, too, is definitely journaling, right? Writing down what, what's going on for you a huge one that I, I love recommending to clients during the integration process is automatic writing. And I think we've spoken about this before in another video, and that is asking the medicine or, uh, or the experience um, or, you know, a higher aspect of self or a different part of self or asking the shadow even to speak through us. So I often will start with writing a question in the journal with one color of pen switching to another color of pen and just allowing whatever words want to come out based on and uh, really setting the intention of who I would like to tap into. Do I want my shadow to have an opportunity to speak? 
Do I want uh, the energy of the plant medicine of ayahuasca to speak? Or um, do I want to connect to my higher self and get some support to help integrate this process? Those would definitely be some, uh, uh, some activities I would recommend. Of course, I think it's really important to have an integration therapist one works with afterwards, right? There is, a, it's difficult doing this work on your own and to have that witness, to have a professional, someone trained uh, that is a therapist uh, that has experience with integration is also key to allow the healing to come from within. So like I said before, we often reach outside of ourselves uh, to find, you know, this is going to work, that's going to work, maybe I'll, I'll do this, maybe that person will help me. The healing's coming from inside. And so uh, once that window has been opened with these altered states of consciousness, these experiences, then we're really able to understand the shadow in a way that uh, uh, will be different from before. Mm, beautifully said. And, and I think the, you know, the going inside component and part of it is so important because then that leads us into the discussion around self-love and self-compassion with regard to shadow work and, you know, the, the importance of that. And I wanted to ask you, how can individuals cultivate a sense of, you know, self-compassion and self-love throughout the whole process of shadow work? Yeah, that's one of the biggest components, one of the largest parts of shadow work, right, is accepting these parts of us that we have put into the shadows that we may have shame and judgment over uh, and recognizing that they too are parts of ourselves and they usually develop because we're needing to survive and cope in the world, right? Um, everyone's just trying to get by. And so often what happens though, is we evolve and we don't need these parts. And, uh, so then we push them down and push them down. We don't acknowledge them. And like I say, they leak out into our life. And so I feel that having compassion for self, recognizing that these parts that are in our shadow, they may have supported us in ways in the past and so as we bring them to the forefront we are shining light on them and giving them an opportunity to speak so if, if we're putting something away and putting it away and putting it away never giving it an opportunity to be felt to be heard to be seen it's going to get louder and louder it's going to become more destructive too so yeah that's what i would say around compassion and compassion of self. What it also does is it helps us accept ourselves in a way that's more complete. Um, that's a really tough one, right? That's what most people are working on is just self-love, self-acceptance. We live in a culture and a world that continuously bombards us with uh, what we're supposed to be like, you know, why we are dysfunctional and need this and that. And this medication or that, right? So we're not promoting any anything here uh, uh, for that. We are uh, just recognizing that this work uh, takes a lot of compassion and it's important to allow these parts of you that you may feel shame over to be seen and heard because there's others that can connect with you and your story helps others heal their own shadows, because it does take a lot of courage and bravery. You mentioned something that I, I'm intrigued about, and that's the concept of how, you know, a shadow or a, a, an aspect of yourself may have been useful to you in the past, you know, but it's still part of your shadow. Could you explain a little bit more about that or give an example of how that might be or what that might look like absolutely yeah yeah there's many examples of that right um and that's that's often one of the keys that we're working with in therapy in art therapy and counseling are um 
these parts of self that we develop usually at a young age, right, uh, as a way to cope with our surroundings, with our world. And so there's so many examples I can use. I think maybe an example I'd like to use is, um, say, uh, a child grows up in a home where the parents fight all the time. And it's difficult for a child feels that if they speak out or if they're loud, they might get a spanking. Maybe the parents were violent too and gave spankings to their kids. And so a kid can grow up believing that speaking out is bad because you're going to get punished. And so don't speak out, don't use your voice, don't cry or show emotion. So they develop this way of being in the world that keeps them safe. And these are usually connected to survival, right? So uh, uh, when a child can't speak out because it's going to be hurt, it's connected to their own survival. And so they grow up feeling, stay quiet, don't use your voice. Uh, no one's going to listen to you anyways. And if they do, you, you might get hurt physically. So a child grows up, becomes an adult, and has a difficult time speaking their needs, say in relationship or in work, in life, and always uh, lets people speak over them or, or feels shy or unable to speak their truth in that moment or in moments when they need to speak for themselves. Uh, so that's just one example, right? Where then we would, and oh, and then to move it into a physical piece, right? Maybe that person develops a thyroid condition on top of that, right? These All these pieces can manifest physically as well. So the work we would do then is uh, shadow work, but also inner child work there. And that's often kind of connected in shadow work is where we go back and find out, right? What happened? Why weren't you allowed to speak? And they may say, well, I have shame because my my voice doesn't sound good or no one's going to hear me so we bring that to the forefront we in that instance we would allow the inner child to speak um <clears throat> allow the shadow to come forward and um be seen be heard we use that we use the art for that we use um uh Meditation can be very supportive, automatic writing, all these creative uh, clinical processes are very supportive that way. So um, that's just one example. There's so many. There can be um, definitely one I see a lot when we're talking about shadow can be a connection to sexuality. Um, so maybe someone has been shamed as a young child for uh, being sexual, right? And that wouldn't be sexual, it would just be natural, a child kind of exploring themselves and uh, growing up feeling that this was a dark, dirty secret that they, they um, may be responsible for, especially when we're looking at sexual abuse. So allowing these pieces to come to the surface, to be seen, to be spoken about, and uh, just creating that safe space to let someone know that uh, all parts of self are welcome. This is a great explanation. Thank you. Now, looking at all parts of self, you know, one of the dark, the darkest aspects of self is suicide, unfortunately. And I wanted to ask you, how does, you know, shadow work address the not wanting to be alive? Yeah, that's such an important topic. Um, Suicidal ideation or uh, people feeling that they just no longer want to be here it happens a lot more than we speak about because there's a lot of shame around feeling suicidal. And that's the problem right there is that people don't feel they can talk to anyone about it, that they will be judged, the ultimate shadow in ways. Um, but what happens when we're working with suicide and it's an area I work a lot in in my private practice actually um, when we're able to speak about it speak about the feelings allow them to be heard in a way that we won't be judged with somebody that can hold that space and be in that darkness 
not want to rescue, right? That's the worst thing to do for someone that's hurting so bad is say, you know, look on the bright side, look at all the great things you have. Oh, it's just awful. Because that just builds more great, more guilt for feeling that way. And so it's, uh, I do find that working with suicide, suicidal ideation uh, can be some of the deepest, most impactful shadow work because we are allowing these feelings to be heard by another. And also what we're doing is we are separating a part of ourselves because what happens when those feelings of suicidal ideation take over, it feels like our entire being is feeling that. And it takes one moment in time for life to end. It also takes one moment in time for life to change. And so what I find is really important is really identifying that there's a part of someone that may want to die in this moment, letting that part speak. But then also recognizing the part that wants to live. And so when we're able to create some separation, uh, we're also able to create strength and acceptance of the suicidal part. Because, yeah, life can be very hard sometimes. And it's important that we support mental health as a society in a way that doesn't shame people for speaking up about these these pieces about suicidal ideation, which ultimately gets pushed pushed so far deep into the shadow. Mm, very interesting. And Charmaine, are there any uh, directives that that you find or that you found particularly effective for shadow work? You know, in the way of meditations or art therapy. Um, and why do you think that they might be well suited for this purpose? Yeah, I definitely, there are some amazing art directives that I've done with people for shadow work. Um, I think I already spoke about the black paper, right? So yeah, that's definitely a good one to help uh, uh, shine light on the shadow um, or create light from shadow to another really great art directive. I have found is working with clay um, to, again, tapping into the body, to the breath, working somatically, feeling the feet on the ground, and just moving the clay, imagining that there is something already living inside, and we're bringing it to the forefront by moving the clay from it. Um, that's also very grounding, the smell of the clay, the earth, using water. Um, and another art directive that I really enjoy is um, uh, one called Feeding Your Demons, where using art therapy and meditation to begin with, right? We always, I usually do a meditation with clients before we, uh, to work somatically before we dive into the art making, is creating an image, a picture of your demon, of your shadow. What does it look like? And then asking it right creating a dialogue with it what does it need what does what does it need to uh feed it what is it hungry for and then we're really kind of going underneath the reason for the shadow uh what what is what's it requiring and uh creating the possibility of negotiating with it too so um, yeah, and I do have, I brought some of my own work here too. If you wanted to see, I worked a lot with shadow work personally. Um, and um, I found clay to be very supportive, uh, as well as art making. I usually create on black paper, but um, yeah, would you like to see some of the pieces? Would love yeah. to see some of them, please. So most of the pieces I've done are clay in math, kind of masks or faces. So I found that this kind of gave a face to the shadow where then I would write a poem about it or just create some dialogue around what this was needing to be seen, um, needing to be expressed. Many, many tears, a lot of water, right? Whenever we're using water in art therapy, we're allowing emotion to move. So I think this one, I. Oh, I think it was days and days that I just moved the material and moved the material. Uh, and then in the end, um, you know, I placed some feathers on it for eyelashes. 
think it's kind of come gone away over time, but there was like a gold mark here, just representing that third eye. Um, and um, yeah, so that one had a lot, a lot of uh, deep, interesting pieces to it. What does the outside material represent on that one? Uh, it's a doily, a doily made of paper. So it just, for me in that moment, uh, it was in the art therapy studio, right? I just saw it and, and I find uh, whatever you're seeing is whatever uh, you're being drawn to, there's a reason for it. So that kind of reminded me of um, uh, my grandma of support, right? She always had doilies in the house. And so this one being paper too, it's a little more fragile. It kind of holds the, the shadow part uh, in a way that's supportive. Um, I created another one here. I think I've mentioned before that I worked in film for over 25 years um, <laughs> on and off. So this one uh, was kind of a, um, yeah, there was a lot of pain that happened in that industry. That can be a very difficult industry to work in. So this one I created film all around the face uh, with a veil, um, a little pearl in its mouth and uh, yeah, little crown pearls. So again, just working with the clay, with the material, uh, with water, allowing these, the process to emerge. And again, another face. So uh, these are all strewn out around my house as reminders, right? Of my own healing that's happened and taken place uh, with, uh, with shadow. That's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that with us. And it's, it's actually bringing up you know, you you making me think of a, a situation that I had um, with regard to clay and art therapy and and therapy in general is that, you know, it was um, about 20, 20, 25 years ago, I lost someone that was very, very dear to me. And it was the first time that I'd actually ever experienced grief on that level. And I remember someone suggesting to me to go and see an art therapist, uh, not an art therapist, a grief therapist. She she specialized in grief counseling. And in one of the first times that I was there, she said to me, could you, she gave me some clay, um, you know, like the clay that you're talking about. And she said, can you take this home? And the next time we see each other, can you make something you know, she she didn't give me any directives. She just said, make um, make something that shows me what your heart feels like at the moment. And so I remember taking this clay home, and um, you know, I'd I'd studied fine art for four years, and so I made this absolutely beautiful clay heart. I mean, it had the most incredible little details and it was very ornate and very um, intricate and but when I was finished I took one look at it and I thought this is not what my heart feels like at all and I remember going to um, a closet um, and taking out this box of pins for sewing and I remember putting taking these pins and one by one embedding them in the clay heart with the the head of the pin sort of embedded in the heart, but with the spiky part facing out. And by the time I was done, this this heart was so it 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 was just oh my gosh, there were so many of these spiky, cold, sharp pins um, sticking out of it in every direction that I couldn't even hold it. And so I remember, and and this is you know in reference to the black paper that you were talking about earlier is that I went into the kitchen and found a black container, not because it was a conscious thought, but it just seemed like the right one to, to put it in. And so I put this spiky, cold, terrible heart inside this black container and delivered it to her. And, you know, the, then there was a whole discussion around that and the, the symbolism about that. But the interesting thing is that I completely forgot about that heart in general until many, many years later when I did a plant medicine ceremony. And in the ceremony, the that very same heart showed up with all the spikes in it. And I remember during the ceremony, uh, I, I witnessed these spikes being pulled out one by one 
and the most radiant luminous light coming out of each one of these holes and so by the time it was done it was no longer this spiky cold heart but it was this beautifully intricate heart that was just radiating light out of every single one of these holes and it just like shone out into the universe I mean it was the most beautiful experience ever so yeah I just I wanted to share that you made me think about it with the clay and with the um, black paper and and therapy and everything that you're talking about thank you for that yeah thank you for sharing wow what an experience and how interesting right that your your psyche just knew that maybe this is what your heart looked like or this is what you wanted to create but then the pins had to be there right there's no glossing over these kinds of pains right we need to really allow them to come to the surface so they can be felt and moved. And how beautiful that your experience with the plant medicine really shifted that in a way that supported that healing and growth. Yeah. Yeah, a beautiful experience in, in general. And I think, you know, grief as far as shadow work goes is, is such a big one and it's such an overwhelming feeling and so debilitating. Um, and yeah, the joy of, of seeing that heart radiating light is... Um, it was it was transformational for sure. So um, Charmaine, what advice do you have for someone who is interested in maybe starting shadow work for the very first time and exploring shadow work, exploring plant medicine? Um, what what steps could you recommend or how, you know, what, what should they prepare um, before embarking on this journey? Yeah, well, I think what I would advise uh, people who are about to use plant medicines anyways, or any kind of entheogen um, to embark on shadow work would be to set some very clear intentions. Uh, also, right, there's all kinds of steps that the shaman they work with will let them know, right, of cleaning your diet up, uh, uh, not just things you eat, but also things that you do. And, but before embarking in shadow work, I think it's really important, as I kind of touched on before, is to create or uh, really ground in to into the body, right? And when I say ground in, I mean um, really feeling it, really understanding it. And that is what healing looks like, what feels good for, for a person, what supports a person. And so it's really important to have that container before diving into shadow work. So recognizing, you know, what are your supports already? Are you, do you uh, go outside? Do you exercise? Do you go outside in nature? Do you have a pet? Do you have friends around you? Uh, really naming and finding out what those supports are and almost creating uh, that intentional connection to these supports before diving in because it's really, uh, it can be really dysregulating if someone just dives into shadow work without having the proper supports. Definitely um, a trained therapist, right? A trained psychotherapist to do this work as well. It can be very important. And I know a lot of people want to do that work on their own and that that's okay too, right? But um, just knowing what your supports are, uh, I, I think is is key. Shaman, you have developed quite a comprehensive course around shadow work. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have. I created an online course for people that do want to do some of their own work on their own. And so that it incorporates art therapy, meditation, kundalini yoga, um, a lot of discussions around the shadow, around um, shadow work, um, a lot of discussions around pieces that come out of the shadow work too, right? Which can be around boundaries, uh, healing inner child uh, uh, experiences. And um, uh, yeah, no, I, I've um, created that course online for people to to take to help support them through that process and I I'm always available to to meet with people through uh, the internet or in person to help support that journey further 
And it's a self-paced course, right? It is. Yes. Yes. My course on shadow work is self-paced. Yes. So people can do it uh, in their own pace and time. The videos uh, for meditations and art directives and yoga videos can be watched over and over. So uh, whatever someone needs to help support their process. Amazing. And one of my favorite questions, because I'm an avid reader and I always, um, I'm always curious to know which books were life changing or, you know, instrumental in shaping someone's beliefs around a certain topic. And I wanted to hear from you what books uh, you you could recommend. And I know you have a huge library and you're a wealth of information. So this is always a good question for you. Um, are there any books that you recommend around shadow work? Yes, absolutely. There are. And I brought a couple of them out here. Um, this one, uh, 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 it is by Saltream Alion. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Feeding Your Demons, an amazing book, uh, about, um, uh, feeding your demons, feeding the shadow, right? Allowing it to come to the surface, figuring out what does it need? What does it want? How can we satiate it? So it's not eating from other places in our life. Uh, and this includes art therapy directives that are just amazing. Love this book. Um, another one that's been hugely transformational. And because I work with suicide and suicidality, um, this book by James Hillman, Suicide in the Soul, was amazing for me to read. And um, I know a lot of a lot of therapists can get, on, even though, you know, working in therapy, it's uh, suicide often comes up. It can be an uncomfortable area for many. And so uh, I found through my own experience of, of uh, suicidality, right, those dark, dark places that I too have been in, um, and through reading this book, it really made it clear that uh, when we're working with one of these darkest aspects of shadow, right? One of these most shameful parts, um, how important it is to sit in that darkness with someone and not try to rescue them or change, um, but really be able to create understanding and acceptance. So we're allowing these feelings to come to the surface in a way where they can be moved, healed, and transformed because as we know, um, when we're working with suicidality, it just takes one moment in time to change everything. And it's not usually that someone wants to die. They just want the pain to stop. So that's another book by James Hillman that I, I highly recommend. And yeah. I actually also have a book recommendation that I loved. It's, it's this one here. It's called The Dark Side of the Light Chasers. Um, by Debbie Ford. Amazing book too. Highly, highly recommend it. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. I haven't read that one. I look forward to diving in, seeing what it's all about. I think you'll enjoy it. So um, Charmaine, uh, to wrap things up, what is your message to the, like your overarching message to the world around shadow work? I guess my message to the world would be that we have individual shadows and we also have collective shadows. And so I find that it's really important when working with either our own personal experiences or collective experiences that we allow these pieces to come to the surface um, and uh, recognize where they came from, what they're needing. Um, and then coming back to like the personal work with shadow work. I find the most important thing is accepting all parts and removing shame. So oftentimes, if we're not able to accept parts that have happened, uh, we can react to them in ways that aren't aren't actually truthful, aren't actually helpful for ourselves. And same goes with society. If we're not ex able to accept the things that have happened in our world, in a way that allows it to come to the surface for healing to happen, uh, it, it can uh, transmute and leak out in other ways that aren't supportive for the growth and sustainability of everyone. Mm, thank you. That's a beautiful message. 
Charmaine, as always, I would like to thank and acknowledge you for these incredible conversations that we have um, and these interviews that we've done together. I'd, I'd like to thank you for your for sharing your knowledge, for sharing your artwork, for sharing your experiences, and most importantly, for opening up and and really creating the space and the opening for the difficult conversations around things like shadow work and and suicide. I, I think it's so important and it's it's such an important role and um, place that you hold for people in general. And so I wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Gaia, for creating this platform for us to have this conversation and share this information with everyone so that uh, others can also feel open and free to share their experiences with others. Because like I said, the most important part is accepting all of us, uh, all parts of self, so that we are able to um, shine light on parts that may feel that we've wanted to hide from the world. And as we shine that light on it, they dissolve. So I celebrate you and thank you again for all the hard work you do in uh, sharing all these, all this healing with the world. And um, yeah, and thank you too to all the viewers and listeners. It's been a pleasure to be here with you today. Yes, and speaking of viewers and listeners and shining a light, if you would like to get in contact with this shining light that is Charmaine, um, I encourage you to in the comments. I also encourage you to like, share, comment, ask any questions that you have um, to Charmaine in the comments below. Um, we will also be putting her link to her course below, to her book recommendations, to her website, so that if, uh, if you'd like to reach out to her, I highly, highly encourage you to. We're also going to put a link to two other video interviews, which are equally fascinating, um, that we had with Charmaine. One is around what to do after your first ayahuasca ceremony and how to integrate all of that. And the other one was around an incredible topic. It was so interesting around sacred geometry. So we'll put all of those and we hope you enjoyed it. And again, Charmaine, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Blessings to all of you. Blessings to you, Gaia. Thanks.